Good morning, everybody. My name is Lieven, Lieven Nees, architect and founding partner at Bluff Architecten in Belgium. Thank you, Constructive Disobedience, for taking action and for reaching out. I'm happy to be here for what promises to be an interesting exchange of critical, uh, on this critical moment in time. Bluff was established in 2003. According to this article, back home we are looked at as both a searching and researching practice, which is a description we like to embrace. As for the searching practice, we have always asked ourselves what our role as architects for society could be and how to channel our engagements within the scope of our profession and yes, also how to make a living from it. As for the researching practice, we combine our practice with teaching and research, trying to create an explorative and well-informed practice-based environment. I'm here to talk about Big Brick Hybrids and the uh, YTB House, an excursion on architecture practice, bricks, the cavity, hybrid construction, ruins, and rematerialization. I have five short chapters for you. First one, 30 ways to build a wall. Our practice established in 2003, around the time of the introduction of the European EPBD, two years before the introduction of the Belgian EPB. During those two decades, we tried to deliver a small-scale production that aimed at being state-of-the-art and always in pace with the progressive regulations. Our, back uh, our background being a fascination for wood construction, which was rather uncommon in those days and also for passive house construction, which was then still mainly a German concept. From that background, we learned to appreciate low-tech design, but also hybrid construction. From the constant struggle and balance between performance, design, and cost, the question of the building became, became the question of the wall composition, of how to make buildings in a way that we hadn't learned in school, by iteration, reformulating a slightly different answer to the same old questions. One of those themes we developed from this was how the geometry of the floor plan, compactness, constructive efficiency, and cost are closely related. And if you put 30 ways to build a wall on a timeline against the progressive energy regulations, it becomes a documentation of the recent history of 20 years of architecture practice. Death to the cavity wall, so no brick so far. Which is strange maybe since brick in Flanders is and has been omnipresent, let's say, since the 13th century. These pictures, taken from the city where I live, show the use of facing brick all through our history and for any type of building, going from the most basic affordable housing to rich public buildings, hospitals, industrial buildings, private villas, and so on. So brick is in the face of the city, but brick is also in our self-image, meaning that through labor, education, craftsmanship, and even fiscality, it is fully intertwined with our economy and our building culture. One might even say our society. This is the cavity wall as I learned it in school 25 years ago. The cavity wall has been the predominant building system for brick-faced buildings in Flanders and many European regions since the 1950s. The shift from solid load-bearing brick construction to cavity wall systems made it possible to deal with water infiltration in masonry. Also, the combination with industrial products like construction blocks for structural use made it possible to reduce the amount of high-quality bricks necessary to make a building. The introduction of the cavity has also changed the image of brick architecture drastically. The half-stone stretcher bond with no headers became standard. Nonetheless, the disconnection between the structural and the facing leaf opened up pathways to new tectonic expressions. This is what roughly would happen between the introduction of the thermal insulation uh, in the 1970s and today. You can see that the, amount, that the amount of thermal insulation in the cavity increases, basically making the building skin thicker. But what is interesting is that thanks to the fact that the cavity is invisible, it is uh, this increasing thickness seems to have no impact on the construction system. But if we zoom in on the construction details, we can clearly see that this invisible evolution did have a big impact on the complexity of building. If we look at the number of nodes that mark all the aspects that are subject to regulations, we see a big increase from left to right. 
We see the addition of ties, foils, connectors, disconnectors, joints, carriers, etc. So the incremental dynamics of continuously causing and solving new problems is leading to something that has become overly complex, expensive, error-prone, and detrimental for the lifespan of the construction. Also in hybrid construction, as you can see here, executability of suspended brick facades has become a big, a big challenge, or should I say, impossible. Complexity, cost practic practicability, and energy performance are thus putting brick as a facade material under a lot of stress. Add to this the race to zero carbon and the fact that gas is one of the two main ingredients of brick, and it is no surprise that brick is quickly losing ground as a facade material of choice. A shift confirmed by this book uh, that was launched in 2015 on Belgian passive house architecture that contains exactly zero buildings with brick facades. The brick industry's, industry's reaction to this is to go on a diet. Material reduction, some even use the term dematerialization. In this case, a slender brick creates two centimeters more space for thermal insulation within the same wall thickness. However, because they are so, so slender, you need more cavity ties to keep the facade leaf up and resistant to wind forces. And its application with mortar is more difficult because of the reduced stability, so these bricks are mostly glued instead. Brick slips allow for spectacular reduction of ceramic material and its carbon footprint without losing the expression of a big brick building. Yet we feel that the idea that anything goes is not necessarily productive for responsible design. So for us, these innovations feel counterintuitive, not only because we were looking for a more circular approach of construction than to glue everything together and reduce what looks like a brick to a complex of inseparable waste, but also because they seem to take us away from the basic properties and assets of brick. Apart from the carbon footprint during production, brick has very low external impact, the, the, the so-called shadow price. Brick has low water impact, low resource impact, low land, land use impact, low toxicity, low maintenance impact, low waste impact. But most importantly, it has a spectacularly long lifespan. So if the application of brick is informed by these assets, we believe that it can stay relevant as a construction material, a potential convincingly displayed in practices of adaptive reuse, like the St. Elizabeth Hospital in Washington, D.C., or from our own practice, much smaller, the TMSN house renovation. The DNA house. For the DNA house, we decided not to go on a diet but to move in the opposite direction, to react to the dematerialization promoted by the brick industry with radical rematerialization, and to make the brickwork work thicker, not thinner, up to the point where it would again have load-bearing qualities. We explored the possibility to make a building as a self-bearing shell with a wooden infill, using the concept of post-insulation like in renovations, but on a new building. You see here on the plan and the section, the shell and the insulated infill. And we built the shell with reclaimed bricks, which are available everywhere in Belgium. Our experience from renovation projects was that the post-insulation of shells is often problematic and complex because of obstacles, like structural embossments on the inside of the wall or the construction knots where the floors are laid on the load-bearing walls. So to make sure that we would have no obstacles on the inside that would prevent us from post-insulating in an efficient way, we made the shell as flat as possible on the inside. So what happened is that because of the flat treatment of the inner side of the wall, all the structural elements required for the structural autonomy of the shell are pushed to the outside. This is how the tectonic expression of the buttresses, the beams, and the cornices emerged, merely as a result of the engineering of the shell. And then we realized that the image of the ruin for us made sense as an expression of the long-term potential of brick. At the same time for us, this confrontation with the long-term image called for a certain design responsibility. Images taken during the construction of the infill and after the delivery of the house.
big brick pilots. Although the DNA, the DNA house showed the potential of the hybrid construction with a self-bearing shell, it was not very economic for the simple reason that labor is expensive and making full stone walls implies the laying of twice as many bricks as a facade leaf. On the left, you see the classic half stone facade leaf. In the middle, you see the traditional load bearing full stone wall used as a self-bearing wall in the DNA house. And on the right, you see a big brick wall that looks like a regular facade, but has the bearing qualities of a full stone wall. So we wanted to make a brick wall that looks like a regular facade, but has the bearing qualities of a full stone wall. That's the basic idea of big brick. An important quality of the big brick is that, it is a face, that, it's, is, that its facing module is the same as a regular facade brick. We found out that making a facade with a bigger module like a construction block does not deliver the same evident appreciation of a facade. The module as a proportion system and how we relate to it is key for the facade concept. Now, with no products available on the market, we tried to convince manufacturers and looked into their production processes. Two batches of big brick were produced so far. The first by Wienerberger on the left. The recipe of the brick was based on an existing brick they had in their catalog. The second one was made by Pluchsteert. The good thing about this brick is that there is no recipe involved. It is a pure product. It contains only one type of clay excavated right next to the production plant. It contains no additives no toxics, no coloring, um, no uh, hydrophobic, hydrophobic uh, products um, or whatsoever. The brick is single fired, so there are no extra flaming processes involved for, ex for uh, aesthetic reasons. And then with these bricks, we made a series of projects, brick pick, uh, big brick pilots. <laughs> Small houses, all based on the same principle of the self-bearing shell with a timber frame infill. The house in Erbsquerps. A house in Ternat. house in Mechelen, our first big brick test on a bigger scale was for a mixed housing block in Ghent, where we used the big brick for a loggia facade. This is the mock-up for the big brick walls that allow the easy posing of balcony plates from both sides. The whole terrace structure remains thermally disconnected from the rest of the building, drastically reducing cold bridges and building knots complexity. And here you can see how the module, how the headers of the big brick fit the module of the regular uh, brick facade on the rest of the building. So this seeming, seemingly um, uh, continues within the same uh, proportion system. So to the YTB house. The reduction of the complexity of the construction has been one of the main points of attention during the realization of our big brick pilots. And since the ventilated cavity is one of the sources of this complexity, it has always been a goal to leave it out. This had been the biggest struggle so far, since the basic function of the ventilated cavity is, of course, to evacuate water, rainwater infiltrating the facing brickwork from the outside and condensation of vapor moving out from the inside. Simulations of some of the wall compositions that we wanted to explore showed increased risk of summer condensation when leaving out the ventilated cavity. Cavity. With its high absorption, our big brick was actually doing quite fine, but the accumulation of water in the insulation could potentially cause the wood structure to rot. That's why we started looking for different insulation materials and we came across lime hemp. As you may know, hemp is a quick growing plant with very low demands in terms of growing conditions, so you can grow it locally, even in urban conditions. What you see on the right here 
is a news item on a new project uh, we are working on, where the client and an urban farmer are growing hemp on the vacant plot, waiting for the project to be realized. Hemp grows really fast, so you can harvest at least twice a year, and during its growth, it captures a lot of CO2. The hemp shells have the capacity to transport water really fast, and if you mix it with lime, you combine this capacity with the high water retainment. When in touch with water, the lime hemp sets and causes a thermal reaction that adds to the prevention of condensation. And the best thing, it will not rot. The only condition to make the lime hemp perform is to create a breathable wall complex. So off we were for a new case, the YTB house. The strategy remains exactly the same, the self-bearing uh, shell with big bricks and a timber frame infill, another freshly built ruin. You can see on the floor plan how the geometry helps to make a really compact house with its brick perimeter, aiming at regular timber frame spans making rooms. The site has a slope from the street level down to the garden, so at the garden level is this floor plan. You see the circulation space in the center of the plan, making the rooms accessible, two big rooms and some technical spaces. The triangular space on the right of the plan is made by the retaining wall of the slope as an outside storage and the triangular space on the top inside the perimeter is a three-story high loggia towards the garden. At the street level, you see a more open plan for the living areas and the kitchen, and you see the entrance loggia. And on the first floor, there are two big rooms, two small rooms, and a bathroom. Here you can see the construction of the timber frame, frame inch inside the shell. With the brick shell protecting the timber frame from the wind forces, we can drastically reduce the sections of the wood construction. The timber frame is then finished with a breathable magnesium board, leaving a cavity of 34 centimeters with uh, the brick shell, which is then completely filmed with lime hemp insulation. I have a little video here that in 40 seconds shows how easy this um, insulation is. You see there's no, no foils, no screens, no nothing, just the timber frame with the board and the brick and you just pour the lime hemp right in. So it's like the best low-tech uh, wall complex we've built so far. Our clients can do this themselves, so three minutes, perfect. <laughs> this results in a building with, uh, which contains no extra steel elements, a minimum of slabs and foils, no glues, no tapes, no cold bridges. Because of the lower complexity, it is easy to build and economically feasible. I'm just going to show you some more pictures of the end result. This is now how the building sits in the streetscape the central staircase from the inside. In the back of this picture, you can see how the outside walls uh, of the house are finished with clay finish on the inside to, make the, uh, to preserve the breathability of the magnesium board. The view to the three-story loggia, the loggia from the outside. And with this, I have finished my presentation. Thank you.